This video is sponsored by Brilliant. You'd never expect to see a rocket being built at the beach, but SpaceX is doing exactly that. Down in Starbase, they're turning traditional rocket assembly processes on their heads, so much so that it can seem pretty confusing, but never fear. We'll give you a deep dive into how SpaceX is constructing the world's first fully reusable spaceship, which will one day take humanity to Mars. If we want to figure out how SpaceX builds a Starship, we need to go to the very beginning. Both Starship and the Super Heavy Booster start off as simple sheets of steel. Coils of 304L stainless steel are delivered to the build site by truck. While these may not seem exciting at first glance, they will soon form the primary structure of Starship. And these coils are nothing to scoff at. Each weighs around 11 tons and stands two meters tall when placed vertically. During the early days of Starship back in 2019, SpaceX were trucking smaller panels to be welded together into rings. Now they've done what they do best and simplified the process a lot. Nowadays, they buy full coils of steel, put them on a stand and partially unroll them. A special jig guides this unrolling steel to become a nine meter diameter circle, which is then cut from the coil and welded into one continuous ring. And voila, we have a steel ring. Now we only need 19 more of them. While they work on those other rings, let's shift over to another part being worked on, the tank domes. The tank domes form the caps of the main methane and oxygen tanks on Starship, while the rings form the tank walls. Unlike the rings, the domes can't be completely made from scratch on site. SpaceX instead trucks in stamped steel pieces, which they bend and weld together to form a complete dome, also called a bulkhead. Notice how these have a gaping hole up top. We'll come back to these in a moment. Going back to the rings, these are now assembled into stacks. Specifically, three stacks of four rings are welded, along with one stack of three and one stack of five. These sub-assemblies are created to allow SpaceX to do more work on the ground, which is safer and faster than doing it up high in the high bays. This pre-assembly also means the ships will spend less time being worked on in the high base, freeing up space for other vehicles to be assembled or worked on. Space in the high base is at a premium. Next, the domes are integrated into the ring stacks through a process called sleeving. Our first dome is sleeved with a three ring stack with a steel cap welded over the top opening. This is known as the forward dome. This section forms the top of the methane tank as well as the bottom of the payload bay. Two openings are cut near the edge of the dome itself to route the header tank lines down to the engines. More on these in a moment. Next up is the common bulkhead welded into a four ring stack. This bulkhead separates the main methane and oxygen tanks on Starship. The methane sump, basically a big funnel, is placed in this opening of this dome. This will feed liquid methane into the transfer tube, which we'll also meet later. The third and final bulkhead is the aft dome, also integrated into a heavily reinforced four ring stack. It acts as the bottom cap of the liquid oxygen tank and has the thrust puck welded onto the opening. The thrust puck, machined from steel, will support and route propellant to the three Raptor sea level engines on the base of the ship. Mounts and propellant lines for the three Raptor vacuum engines are installed towards the outer edges of this dome, although no actual engines are installed at this time. Once the domes are integrated, other components can be added in. This includes tank vents, stringers for a reinforcement, and minor plumbing for things like tank pressurization. Next, the heat shield tile mounting pins are robotically welded on. Then a thick thermal resistant padding is added. This gives an additional layer of thermal protection to the ship, giving it a better chance of safely passing through re-entry. The thermal protection tiles are attached at this point as well. SpaceX makes these hexagonal tiles in Florida, however equipment was previously seen arriving in Boca Chica to build a tile factory there alongside the Cape facility. There are several different sized tiles, but they generally measure around 30 centimeters across. Each ship needs around 17,000 of these. Hey Ryan, don't mind me flying in here like a piece of concrete. Is that too soon? Anyway, I heard you talking about the rings and all of that. And it reminded me of one of the thousands of courses that's available on Brilliant.org. For those who don't know, Brilliant.org is the best way to learn about different math and science topics, and it's all interactive. Whether your goal is to work on Starship or just get a better understanding of how the world around you works, Brilliant can help. 
Oh, right. The lesson I was thinking of. Sorry, there's so many new ones that get added every month that I get lost in them. Anyway, you were talking about the rings, and if you're building something that size, you want to make sure you get your measurements right. Brilliant has a course that takes a look at some of the math needed to make sure your booster is the right size, especially when scaling, and includes everything from fractions to surface area and more. To get started with a 30-day free trial, visit brilliant.org slash NASA Spaceflight or click the link in the description below. The first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. Okay, Ryan, I'm done. Sorry for interrupting. I know you were just getting to a really big moment. And now, without further ado, we can begin vehicle stacking. The assembly of a ship starts from the top down, beginning with the nose cone. The nose cone, like the bulkheads, is made from prefabricated steel pieces. Specifically, two types of pieces are assembled into two separate rings and then attached together. A small elliptical cap is then placed on top. Inside the nose cone are placed the header tanks. These hold the propellant needed for the ship's landing burn and can only feed the sea level raptors. The methane header tank is a simple ball, while the liquid oxygen header tank actually uses the tip of the nose cone as a portion of the tank. The header tanks reside in the nose cone to act as a counterweight, balancing out the mass of the engines on the opposite end of the ship to ensure that Starship stays stable during descent. Plumbing is routed down to the engines through the main propellant tanks by the pipes mentioned earlier. Also installed are the forward flap supporting hardware and motors. Each flap on Starship is controlled using two Tesla Model 3 rear drive unit motors. The high torque and overall simplicity of electric motors make them perfect for this task and eliminate the need for a complex and heavy hydraulic system. The nose cone also has heat shield tiles applied to it, though these need to be angled a bit to work with the irregular shape of the nose cone and flap supports. The barrel is what contains the Starlink satellite deployer, affectionately nicknamed the Pez Dispenser. It features an internal support structure for a stack of satellites and a long thin hatch to deploy them. A fun side note, the nose cone barrel is actually made of 3.6mm thick steel while the rest of Starship is currently made from 4mm thick steel. Might not seem like a big difference, but thinner steel is lighter, meaning Starship can take more payload to orbit. The nose cone assembly is then stacked atop the common dome section. This is then stacked into the mid-lock section and finally onto the engine section. Until very recently, SpaceX assembled ships in two sections. The nose cone, or payload bay, was assembled on its own, consisting of the nose cone itself, the nose cone barrel, and the forward bulkhead. At the same time, the propulsion section was assembled, made up of the mid-lock section, the common bulkhead, and the aft skirt, or engine section. Starting with Ship 28, this method was changed to where they assemble the whole ship from the top down, likely speeding up the process. Once this is done, the aft flaps are installed. The remaining tiles are also added along the weld lines. And finally, we have a complete Starship, so let's make sure it actually works. The newly stacked vehicle without Raptor engines installed now departs the production site for the 2.4 mile trek to the launch site. Once it arrives, a crane lifts it onto suborbital pad A. Here, the ship undergoes cryogenic proof testing. What this means is that its propellant tanks are filled with liquid nitrogen and pressurized, while thrust rams push on the Raptor engine mounts to simulate engine thrust. These tests are usually used to verify that the tanks can hold cryogenic liquids, withstand flight pressures, and sustain the forces of the Raptor engines firing simultaneously. Should this testing be a success, the ship is then removed from the pad and returned to the build site. The ship is then outfitted with its three sea level and three vacuum Raptor engines. For those of you who are unaware, Starship features both sea level and vacuum versions of the Raptor engine. These two engine types feature different size nozzles to make them more efficient at different altitudes. As you can probably tell from the name, sea level Raptors work well at low altitudes in the atmosphere, while vacuum Raptors are most efficient in the vacuum of space. The higher efficiency of the vacuum Raptors help to increase Starship's payload capacity, especially to places beyond low Earth orbit. The sea level engines are critical for landing because beside the high efficiency in the atmosphere, vacuum engines can actually sustain damage or fail when operated too close to sea level. With its six engines installed, the ship again returns to the launch site. This time it is placed on suborbital pad B to undergo static fire testing. This is where all six Raptor engines are ignited for a few seconds as a final check to ensure everything on the vehicle is working properly. Multiple static fires may take place, including some that only feature an engine or two. 
And with that, Starship has passed its pre-flight testing. If it wasn't already done, the vehicle is loaded with Starlink satellites using a special loader. Satellite loading seems to only occur in one of the high bays, so a rollback may be required for that. The ship is then stacked atop its assigned booster on the orbital launch pad and may undergo a few more tests, including additional cryogenic testing or wet dress rehearsals. And if you'd like to have a high quality metal print of a fully stacked Starship and super heavy on your wall, head over to shop.nasaspaceflight.com. It's a great way to support the channel and to make these videos possible. And now, the moment you've all been waiting for. It's launch day. Both the ship and booster are loaded with propellants over the course of an hour. As the minutes tick down, the tanks are pressurised, the computers take control of the countdown and the pad's fire suppression system engages. Super Heavy ignites its 33 Raptor engines and the massive full stack lifts off on its way to orbit. Super Heavy burns for around two minutes, accelerating Starship enough to leave the Earth's atmosphere. The two vehicles then separate. Super Heavy returns to Earth for a landing while our ship ignites its six Raptor engines to continue to orbit. Around eight minutes after liftoff, Starship shuts down its engines safely in orbit. Over the coming hours, it will deploy its payloads before reigniting its Raptors once more to deorbit itself. Starship will then re-enter the Earth's atmosphere and make a soft powered landing on the ground. Having proven itself on its maiden voyage, our Starship is then readied for its next flight, taking several more tons of payload to orbit, only to return again. I'd like to thank Brilliant for sponsoring this video. You can get 20% off your annual Brilliant subscription and a free 30-day trial by going to the link down in the description. So now you know how to build a Starship, although we don't recommend you try it at home. If you want to watch professionals build Starships live, check out Starbase Live, our 24-7 live stream of all activities at SpaceX's Boca Chica site. We'll see you over there in chat, but for now, thanks for watching and goodbye.